One of the really impressive things you learn when you read the Buddha's awakening is how often he tested it. He looked at it from many angles. Could he see any any effluence at all in his mind? Could he see any defilements? Was there any limitation on his knowledge? The one limitation he admitted to was knowledge of the future. And that's because, as he saw, the future is not totally predetermined. There may be tendencies, and sometimes he would make predictions about the future, that there would be tendencies in the future, the downfall of the Dhamma, the, the arise of counterfeit Dhamma, the disappearance of the true Dhamma. Monks who didn't practice, and as they said, spent their time searching out the topmost flavors with the tips of their tongues. But as for when this would happen and who would do it, that he didn't say. Because we do have freedom of choice. We can choose not to be those types of people. We can work on it. But one thing he did know about the future was that he had no rebirth waiting for him, because there were no possible seeds in his mind. But he checked again and again. There's even a passage where he talks about how if his awakening really were the awakening of a, a true Buddha, he'd have to know about all about devas, what levels there were, how he had been that particular level in the past. The only levels he hadn't been in were the levels where the non-returners go. How to talk with the devas to see where their limitations were. So he looked at his awakening from all angles. That was why when he taught he was confident in what he had to say. So when you take the Buddha as an example, that's one of the main things we should take as an example, is a willingness to test our knowledge, test our understanding. Sometimes we think the knowledge we get from books is uncertain, but the knowledge that comes from meditation is to be trusted. But not always. It depends on how you treat that knowledge, the extent to which you're willing to ask questions about it, look at it from different angles. This is where the fact of having a committee of the mind, which can so often be a problem because it's pulling in different directions, can be helpful. There'll be part of the mind that gets convinced about something. Look around for another part of the mind that's willing to question it. You think of a John Munn in the forest. He realized very quickly that if he believed everything that came in his visions, he was going to go crazy. So even if it seemed to be the Buddha coming to talk to him or Davis coming to talk to him, the question wasn't, who is this that's giving me this information and how much can I trust that person? The question is, well, what does the information have to say? Is it something that fits in with the Dharma as I know it? If it doesn't fit in with the Dharma, you can forget about it. If it does fit in with the Dharma, to what extent is it really useful? And so you put it to the test. And putting it to the test means that you have to be a fair judge. It's one of the reasons why the Buddha started his meditations and instructions to Rahula, with advice that he should try to make his mind like earth. Because the more you're able to be with pleasant and unpleasant things and not let them overcome you, the more you can trust your judgment of them, to see where they come, see where they go. So the question isn't, what is the source of this knowledge, the vision and the meditation, or what's often called the knowledge of the body. Your body has been so shaped by your mind and so shaped by your defilements. The body can't be trusted as a source of knowledge either, because your greed, aversion, and delusion have learned how to hijack your breath. And through the breath, they get in control of the hormones. And so the way you feel your body from within often has nothing to do with any wisdom at all. It more has, has more to do with the fact that you have certain habits. When anger comes, you tense up the body in one way. Greed comes, lust comes, 
fear comes, laziness comes. When you're feeling lazy, you can create all kinds of sensations in the body that make it seem really convincing that you'd have to rest. So you have to take a questioning attitude. You have to learn how to read yourself. And that means learning how to step back. Because you can't spend all your time with a teacher and ask questions of the teacher and fully trust the answers you're going to get. You've got to test them. After all, it is your breath and your relationship to the body. You have a history that you should know better than anyone else. So when you get angry, how does the anger take hold of your breath? When you get lustful, how does the lust take hold of your breath? What can you do to counteract that? Use your powers of observation. Use your ingenuity. And John Fuang's refrains. But also use your powers of concentration, mindfulness, the things that make the mind more and more steady. Because if the mind isn't steady, it's hard to see what's actually going on and to make a fair judgment. It's like getting very precise scientific equipment, but putting it on a wobbly table. The wobbles of the table are going to make whatever output from the equipment may be, make it totally unreliable. You've got to get things firmly, firmly established. And because the mind is more complex than physical things, you learn how to look at things from different directions. And it's in this way that you internalize the teachings. You test the teachings at the same time that you test yourself. And over time, think about the Buddha's requirements for a student. He went as someone who was observant and no deceiver. In the first instance, that's someone who doesn't deceive other people, but also doesn't deceive him or herself. That's a big, tall order. And John Cha once said that one of the first things you begin to notice when you really look at the mind with all honesty is how dishonest it can be. So both the mind and the body can be dishonest. But it also, they also have their potential for honesty, particularly the mind. It's the mind that we're training. We use the body to get more and more sensitive to how our unskillful emotions can take over our sense of just who we are inside. We're living in the body, and then they can make the body really, really uncomfortable. As they say in Thailand, it puts a squeeze on your nerves. So you feel you have to act under, <clears throat> under those defilements. Well, learn how to resist that. This is one of the reasons why we work with the breath. We're taking the breath back, learning to get it on our side. And from the breath, that affects other physical processes in the body as well. And as you develop these habits, you do become more and more reliable. And you do begin to get some knowledge you can trust. Think of the Buddha talking to the Kalamas. Just because a teacher says something doesn't mean it's true. Just because it's in the text doesn't mean it's true. Everybody likes that part of the, the sutta. But he also says, just because something seems reasonable doesn't mean it's true either. Because it fits in with your preconceived notions doesn't mean it's true. You've got to test and see, and does a particular teaching, a particular understanding, cause harm, or does it not cause harm? And what counts as harm? And how sensitive are you to the harm that your actions can do? So that's not the Buddhist charter of free inquiry, as they call it. 
it's this indication of what standards you have to adopt if you really want to find the truth. So when your standards are true, then you're more and more likely to run into what is true and to recognize it as true. It's something you can trust implicitly, but it has to pass the test first. So be willing to test things. Years back, John Mahabua made a comment about Ajahn Sawat to the fact that he had already finished his work as a meditator. Word got to Ajahn Sawat, and he didn't take it as 100% guarantee. He kept questioning. And one day he told me after the meal, you know, when Ajahn Mahabhu said that, it wasn't true. So even when you get certification from somebody as trustworthy as that, you still have to test it. Because you're going to be the final judge. Does your knowledge really help put it into suffering? Does it help you look at your habits? that are unskillful, and it'll pull you out of them. When you put things to that test again and again and again, then you become a more reliable judge, and the knowledge you gain can become more reliable as well. 